the Gospel of Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. Who's glad to be here today? Amen? Amen. Listen to what the Word says. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master, when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself, have them sit down to eat, and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant say in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and who in the room would agree with me? That's where the majority of people are today. The master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him. He will come when he is not looking for him. And at an hour when he is not aware, will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. He who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For every one to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you today for your glory to remind us that you're coming. Help us not to laugh about it, to ignore it. Help us not make a mockery of it. Help us look with patience, serving you with joy, knowing that soon you are returning. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. And everyone in the house said amen. amen. Like some of you in the room, I remember Y2K. <clears throat> I'm telling you, it almost got to a point where you were scared to go to church. Everyone was telling you the whole world was falling apart and everything was going to collapse. If any of you ask me what is Y2K, I just want you to know I hate your stinking guts. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> but to all of us that do know and do remember, wasn't it an interesting time? Monday, the eclipse. And there are just some people who cannot help themselves. They absolutely have to look, watch this, at the Bible through events rather than looking at events through the Bible. In other words, watch this, their understanding of the Bible is flavored by whatever's going on this particular week. And they allow themselves, watch this, to be controlled by the media, by politicians, by current events. It is an absolute travesty that so many people get sucked in to this kind of foolishness. Here is the concern of my heart. The concern of my heart is, watch, we perpetuate that so much that the lost world laughs at us when we continue to share, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Hey, there's an eclipse. There was an earthquake in Jersey. There's going to be an eclipse on 4-8. And look, this verse says 4-8. And I'm telling you, he's coming. He hasn't come. And what happens is we lose all credibility as Christians by peddling that garbage. We make a mockery of the reality of the coming of the Lord. And there are so many people who bury their head in the sand because of us, watch this, crying wolf and listening to false prophets. Let me tell you right now, anyone that says they know when Jesus is coming again should be marked. They're a false prophet. They're not of God. And if you take issue with me saying that, open your Bible and read. For the Bible says no man knows the hour or the time when the Lord's coming again. And you don't have special revelation. 
And your special preacher does not have special revelation. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we have got to stop sending these uncertain signals to a world who buries their head in the sand and laughs at us because we continue to stand up and say, hey, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Listen, stop it. Let's talk about the reality that Jesus is coming again and no one in this room knows when. Someone asked me, do you think concerning the eclipse, do you think that Jesus is coming? And I said, well, I can assure you of this. He's not going to come Monday. (laughs) How do you know that? Because it's at an hour when you're not looking for it. It may be Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not really sure. (laughs) Not many folks are paying attention on that day. Can I get an amen? (laughs) But if there is anything that should get our attention, it's what started yesterday. Now, preacher, are are you worried about the repercussions of Iran bombing Israel? Well, sure. Could Russia get involved if we get involved in China and what we've read about in Scripture? Well, maybe. But I can tell you this, we better not lose our minds. And if it does happen, we better not be crazy. And let me just ask you this question. Had Jesus really come on Monday during this eclipse, would you have been ready? Would you have been prepared? Or are we so focused looking at signs and graphs and charts that we neglect the fact that every one of you, every one of us in this room one day is going to stand before a sovereign, holy God who has feet like brass and eyes like fire? Have we become so arrogant religiously that we gather around coffee pots and argue about the finer points of Bible prophecy and we neglect the reality that he is coming? Now, I want you to know I believe in the rapture of the church. If you don't believe it, well, then you can go somewhere and preach what you believe. But I want you to know I believe there's going to come a day when the trumpet's going to sound and we're going to get out of here. That's what I believe. Uh, If you want to stay around and get to know the Antichrist on a first-name basis, that's your business. But I'm getting out of here on the first load. And whoever wants to go, I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. We're going to hear the toot and we're going to scoot. Can I get a witness from anyone? (laughs) Amen? And I don't know when. I'm not sure. You don't know. No one knows. No one in this room knows. But I'm going to tell you, the heartbreak as a pastor is that what I'm discovering is so many in the church, can I just tell all of us the truth? So many of us are becoming so numb to it that we're absolutely ignoring the fact that Jesus is coming. And I've got news for every one of you. He's coming. If you're ready, he's coming. If you're not ready, he's coming. If you're prepared, he's coming. If you're unprepared, he's coming. If you laugh at it, if you think it's a joke, he's coming. I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ is coming. One-fifth of all of the Bible lends itself to the study of eschatology or of end times or to Bible prophecy. There were 108 prophecies that pointed to the first coming of Christ. For every one, there are five that points to the return of Christ that Jesus is going to come again. And I'm just convinced that what we do is we become, watch this, so involved in trying to study, well, what does revelation mean? What are the three dreadful woes? And what are the seal judgments? And what about all of these earthquakes? And what about this and this and this and the water turning into blood? And, And we get so preoccupied with that that we make it all about an event and we miss the most significant part of all of it. And that is we're going to see Jesus. He's coming. He's coming to get us. And it's not escapism. It's just the reality that we want to stay focused on him because one day he's going to return. And I don't know about you, but when he does, I just want to say, welcome back, Jesus. Amen? So I want you to notice in this particular passage what the Lord has to say to us as it relates to his return. You know and I know all throughout Scripture he gave us promises that he's going to come. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what did he say? I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is going to come. Verse 36 of what I read says, he will return. Verse 37 says, when he cometh. Verse 40 says, the Son of Man cometh. Verse 43 says, when he cometh. Verse 46 says, he will come. Jesus is making it very plain in this passage that he's going to return again. In fact, every almost, 
let me say it this way, almost every call, nearly every call to us living holy in the New Testament centers around the return of Jesus. And the point is, I ought to live a holy life, watch this, not because of do's and do nots and rules and regulations, but because Jesus is coming again and I want to be prepared for his return. It is absolutely astounding to me as a pastor how much the enemy has tried to keep us from talking about this truth. In fact, people laugh about this. People mock. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not defending those who are lost mocking because as I said a few minutes ago, We've given them reason to mock by making such silly statements as he's going to come on the day of the eclipse. And we've got to stop this foolishness. And instead, we've got to say, Jesus is coming. And when you're asked, when is he coming? Say, I don't have a clue. God has his day on his calendar. And he's not allowed me to share his calendar. And I don't know yet when he's coming. But I know this, it could be today. Could be tomorrow. Could be a hundred years. We don't know. But what we do know is we want to live in light of the fact that one day soon he's coming and we want to be prepared. And hey, guess what? Before I go any further, newsflash. Maybe the rapture's not going to happen today or this year, but the return of Jesus may happen soon for some of us in this room because none of us have assurance that we'll live to see another day. And so let's talk about the return of the Lord. Who in the room is listening? Say amen. amen. Number one. Jesus teaches you and me in these verses that his coming is sure and I should be anticipating it. Do you know the Bible promises crowns for those that look for the coming of the Lord? Did you know that? I mean, we're people that love incentives and bonuses and recognitions and rewards. Do you know according to the Bible? I mean, you need to know this. There is a crown of life that's going to be given to those who love the Lord's appearing. Who understands that today? Do you know there's a difference between loving Jesus and loving his appearing? We'll get to that in a moment. Let me take a quick test. Who in the room loves Jesus? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. Woo! 100%. I mean, do you love him? Say amen. amen. Okay, now don't answer this question. Some of you are not going to be able to help yourself. You just will have to. But here's the question we're going to look at today. Do you love his appearing? Now, you may love Jesus, but there's a difference in loving him and loving his appearing. What are we learning from these verses? Verse 35 through 38 tell me that his coming is sure and as a result, I should be anticipating the coming of the Lord. I just wonder how many of us got up today, this morning, I'm speaking to me, and just said, you know, this could be the day, and I'm really anticipating the coming of the Lord. I, I wonder how many of us. I wonder about tomorrow. I'm telling you, most of us, we're so preoccupied with stuff in the world, yes or no? We're so focused and absorbed in stuff that it's consuming us. Now, in these verses, we see a group of servants who are in the palace of their master, their master is currently gone, and they're left alone, and they're waiting on his return. And Jesus is speaking to them, and he's trying to share some truth with them. He says in verse 35, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Literally, it's a phrase that means to gird up your loins, is what the King James would say. And what he's saying is this, watch. Back in those days, they had long flowing gowns that made it very difficult to work. So when it was time to work or when it was time to run, for example, they would take a belt and they would basically cinch all of those flowing garments up, all of the loose garments that were overflowing together in order that they would not trip, in order that they would not be hindered, in order that they would not be encumbered. And what the Lord is telling you and me is, watch this, as we anticipate the coming of the Lord, there should be readiness, which means we should make ready. Here are these men, these servants, they're waiting on their master, and the picture is they're ready to work. They're ready to go. In other words, they don't have to get ready. They're already ready. And the Lord is telling you and me in these verses that our loins are to be girded, we're to be prepared, we're to be ready. In other words, don't allow the affairs of this world to so weigh us down that we cannot get focused on the fact that Jesus is coming. Now, church, I, I'm telling you, I've got to let you know this morning, I'm really in a good mood, amen? And if it sounds like I'm not in a good mood, I'm sorry. I'm just telling you right now, we are becoming such, I'm telling you in the church, I'm not talking about America, Montgomery County, I'm talking about in the church culture, God deliver us from this. We're just, we, we means me, that means all of us, amen? We are just becoming so self-centered, so preoccupied, so focused on self God deliver us, God help us, God set us free, and it's time for us to get everything that's in the way in our life that's hindering us from focusing on Jesus out of the way. Stop it. 
I mean, we can't even see the forest for the trees. We, we can't even see the reality that Jesus is coming again. It's because we're so preoccupied. Who in the room is busy? Everyone's busy. I remember not long ago, I was doing a revival in South Carolina, and I bumped into a couple uh, at a store, and they were 85 and 86. And I told them about the revival, and I invited them to come that night. And they said, oh, we can't come. And I said, well, why not? They said, we're too busy. 85 and 86, too busy. That's a lot to look forward to, yes or no. And everyone's busy. What are we busy doing? I mean, we're just so busy and preoccupied with what? With what are we busy with? We're busy with stuff. Is it really important? Okay, you say it's important, right? I mean, we can justify whatever we want to justify. I mean, pe pe people are too busy to go to church. People are too busy to get in a life group. People are too busy to go to outreach. People are too busy to get involved. People are too busy to, bu bu get, busy to get plugged in. People are just busy. Everyone's busy. And we just wear busyness with a badge of honor. And I get it and I understand it. But I'm just here to tell you, you need to hear it from me. The only thing that's going to matter in your life, big boy, 100 years from now is what you've done with Jesus. The only thing that's going to matter is not our career, but what we've done with Jesus. That's all. Everything else is going to fade. Everything else is going to go away. And Jesus is saying to these servants, you need to be ready. You need to be watching. They've got, listen, they've got their garments cinched up, ready to go, ready to work, ready to watch. And then he said, keep your lamps burning. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us something about the world. Why do you need a light? Because there's darkness. And I believe Jesus is telling us that in the midst of this dark, chaotic world in which Jesus is going to return, and who in the room knows, watch this, it's becoming gloriously dark out there. Amen. Think of that, gloriously dark. I've got to say it. It's been a while since I've said it, so I've got to say it again. We look at everything, lose our mind, and say it's all falling apart. No, sir, it's all coming together. God is not in heaven saying, oops. He's not wringing his hands. He's not bothered. He's not having to have an emergency meeting in heaven. What are we going to do with Iran? What are we going to do with the President of the United States? What are we going to do with the Secretary of State in America? What are we going to do with the American government? What are we going to do with Russia, with China? What we... God knows what he's doing. He's in control. And I'm telling you, when we think about current events, it ought to bring joy in our heart to know that we serve a God that's on his throne and is in control. Amen? Whew. My goodness gracious, just every once in a while, we just need to get fired up, yes or no? We need a pep rally for Jesus. Who knows what I'm talking about? Man. Mm. And so he says, in this world, you need your lights. They need to be lit. I'm telling you where your light need to shine, needs to shine is in your home. Your kids need to see the light. You say, well, now I don't want to push my kids. I mean... Good night, man. Have you ever talked to these parents that say, well, I don't want to force my kids to go to church? I've had parents tell me that. I don't want to force them to go to church. Okay, stop forcing them to go to school. Honey, I want you to make your choice. That's up to you. It's optional. I want you to make the decision. Quit forcing them to go to the dentist. How cruel of you to make them go to the dentist. Let their teeth just rot out of their head. Who knows what I'm talking about? No, we're not taking you to the doctor. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to make you do homework. You don't like that. And then you're going to sit here and say, well, I'm not going to force them to go to church. Well, you better get them to church. Hello, somebody. For the three of you that amen, I appreciate that. <laughs> you better get them to church. Well, preacher, I mean, what if they pitch, they pitch a fit about everything else? Just get them to church, yes or no. They'll be okay. They'll live. They'll be all right. Get them here. Live it. You ought to turn the light on, yes or no. And it tells me a little of the condition of the world prior to the return of the Lord. The reason our lights need to be lit is because we're in the midst of a chaotic, dark, sinful world. But it tells me also, watch this about my witness. Light your lamps. What's he saying? We need to shine the light in the midst of the darkness. Prior to the coming of the Lord, rather than just getting in holy huddles, talking about the eclipse or the events of the day, what we need to do, you ready? Is get out there in the lost world light our lamps, shine the light in the darkness. We're called to be light. We're called to be salt. Salt is no good in the shaker. We've got to get it out there in this world. Amen? So, Lord, help us. But then he tells us about waiting, verse 36. He says, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master 
so that when he will return from the wedding, when he comes and knocks, you may open to him immediately. In other words, don't be asleep. Be ready to open the door. You need to be waiting. What's he saying? His coming is sure. We should be anticipating. There should be readiness. Secondly, there should be happiness. Now look at this, verse 37. Is it okay that I talk about happiness in church on Sunday? Amen? Amen? I know a lot of folks, none of you, of course, but I I know a lot of folks that go to church and they just want to always have something to fuss about. Yes or no? Did you hear about the pastor got up one Sunday and he said, before we get started, he said, Brother Smith, would you stand and lead the congregation in a word of criticism? Who knows what I'm talking about? (laughs) Some people are convinced they have the spiritual gift of dissension and discouragement. Does anyone know? Amen. Don't look around at other people. Look right here at me. Stay focused, people. It's okay to talk about being happy in Jesus. Yes or no? Well, look at what he says, verse 37. Blessed are those servants, happy are those servants, whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself. That's a change. You mean to tell me the master is going to absolutely gird himself and have the servants sit down and serve them? Let me ask you this. Do you know of any other that will do that? I can promise you the devil will not do that. He'll promise you all kind of joy and fun and laughter, but I'm telling you, you'll always be a slave to his devices. There is no other God, no other God preached that will serve. And yet here is our Savior who has every right to say, no, you serve me. But the Bible says when he comes and finds you watching, he'll gird himself and he'll sit you down and he'll serve you. And then he says, happy are the servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. What's he trying to say to you and to me? In other words, there can be real happiness. Listen to me very carefully. One of the reasons I went on a little earlier talking about uh, Y2K and the eclipse and some of these events is because when you're around people like that, these doomsday prophets, and I get it, Jesus is coming, and I get it, it's not going to be fun after he comes here on this earth, and I get it, we need to be prepared, and we need to sound the alarm, and we need to warn people, yes or no? I have told you repeatedly, someone ought to mark this down and put it in a time capsule. This church will exceed its all-time attendance record the Sunday after the return of Jesus. I will not be preaching that day. I don't know who. There'll be some LGBTQ plus liberal preacher, but it will not be me preaching that day because I'm getting out of here. And yes, I just said it, hallelujah. I haven't had sugar in a week and I'm stirred up. I could eat a 10-pound bag of sour candy right now. Can I get a witness from anyone? And my wife won't let me, and I'm as mad as a hornet about it. Yes or no? So if you're our guest, come back next Sunday. I'll be my usual sweet self, but today I'm holding nothing back. I said it. An LGBTQ plus liberal lesbian will probably be preaching, but it will not be me. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is coming, and we need to get out of here. All right, Lord, help me keep myself together. Amen? Mm. Jesus is coming. I don't even know what I was trying to say. You folks made me so mad, I don't even know what I was preaching. (laughs) Jesus is coming. I was trying to talk about happiness, and y'all got me all stirred up. (laughs) Man, these people that are out here, these doomsday prophets, and my goodness, they just make the return of Jesus sound so icky. And just, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes or no? And I mean, you just can't smile and, you know, well, what if the Lord would have come Monday? I walked out, looked in the sky, couldn't see anything but clouds. (laughs) It's all we saw. Don't you feel sorry for the people that spent thousands of dollars to travel so they could see the eclipse? Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Welcome to Texas. Amen. I don't mean what I'm about to say to be ugly, but I'm telling you the happiest people on planet earth ought to be those that are washed in the blood, saved by the grace of God, believers in Jesus Christ, those that believe the Bible. You can call us crazy, fuddy dud, narrow-minded, bigots, whatever names you want, just whatever you need to do to make yourself feel better. Homophobe, Islamophobe, just, just pile it on, whatever. If, that's ma- if that makes you sleep at night, just say it. Well, you're just weak-minded people that need a crutch to lean on. You're ignorant. You don't know what two plus two is, just go on. But if, that, if that's what makes you happy, sweetheart, knock yourself out. But I'm telling you right now, the happiest people on planet earth ought to be those who know they're saved, who know the word of God, and know that Jesus Christ is coming again, and we're going to go be with him. We ought to be the happiest people. We ought to be the most excited people. Amen? 
Don't spread a bunch of propaganda this week. Scare folks to death. Gas is going to go to $20 a gallon because Iran attacked Iraq. Well, a, a tank of gas don't last me long. So if I did go run today and get it and save some money, I'll need more in just a couple of days. So unless you can do something to keep the price of oil from skyrocketing this week and hold it down, just stop talking about it. And I get it. The economy, it's in a mess. And people are hurting, and I understand it. And it's a serious deal, and we ought to care, and we ought to be concerned. But quit using your testimony as a Christian to try to spread stuff that's not true. What is true, Jesus is coming. What is true is you and I do not know when. And what is true is we need to be ready for whenever he does come. And what else is true is we can have the joy of the Lord in the midst of it. I'm telling you, in the church, there's two kind of people. There's the frozen chosen and the happy clappies. And I don't mind telling you right now, I'd rather spend my life with the happy clappies. Can I get a witness from anyone? That's who I want to be around. And I'm just telling you, blessed are those who find are found watching when he comes. You can enjoy the Lord. You can enjoy the return of the Lord. You don't have to talk about this with fear. You don't have to talk about this with panic. Oh, preacher, what's going to happen to me? Listen, you don't have to face it that way. I'm telling you, if you know Jesus, it ought to be the most exciting thing in your life to know that one day he's going to come. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Amen? Amen? Y'all can have all my stuff when I'm gone. Those thieves that want my truck, you can have this one when I'm gone. <laughs> Take it and pay the note on it too. Can I get a witness? I'm telling you, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Jesus is coming, and his coming is sure, and I should be anticipating his coming. Uh, secondly, his coming is going to be sudden, and I should be looking. Now look at verse 39. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken in two. Therefore, you be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. What is Jesus telling us? He's telling us that his coming is going to be sudden, suddenly, unexpectedly, unannounced. He describes it as being like a thief. Elsewhere in the New Testament, he calls it like being a thief in the night, unannounced. You'll never hear of a thief getting on the phone, calling you up, saying, I want you to know at 1216, I'm going to break into your home and I'm going to rob you. They'll never announce it. <clears throat> And I'm here to tell you, that is why you're not, I'm not, we're not going to figure out the day that Jesus is coming. I don't remember the author, but you remember he wrote uh, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 88? That's 1988. <laughs> that book's out of print. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> we're in 2024, yes or no? And then, you know, there was Y2K. And then a few years ago, it's not been too long ago, just a few years ago, you remember the, the other guy, can't, rem can't remember his name, but he said Jesus was going to come on a certain day and he predicted the day. I mean, it's po probably been seven years ago, eight years ago, something like that. And he didn't come. And so he revised it and said, well, well, I got it wrong. It's not this day. It's the next day. And then that day passed and I haven't heard anything out of him. <laughs> yes or no? Right? But church, please hear your pastor, please. Don't allow that to numb you to the fact that he is coming. See, this is what I'm trying to get across to us. This stuff out here is foolishness and it's ridiculous. But this stuff right here is true and trustworthy. Are you listening? And we should stop deciphering the Bible through current events. Stop it in the name of Jesus. And we should start viewing events through the Bible because this is the authority. Are you listening? Not NASA, not the Weather Channel, not politicians. This is the authority. And Jesus is coming again, and his coming is going to be sudden, unannounced. And here what he says is this. If the master of the house would have known, he would have been prepared. Well, the truth of the matter is, watch, <laughs> We do know he's coming. 
We don't know the hour or the time. The question is often asked, if you knew Jesus was coming at high noon tomorrow, is there anything you'd change in your life? And of course, everyone would say yes. And what we're admitting is there's things we should be doing we're not doing now. I mean, he could come at any moment. Amen? I think a great way, and of course the Lord doesn't ask me, would be to finish church, have about 20 people saved, and then boom. I'd like it. Yes or no? Amen? I'd even skip lunch. Can I get a witness from anyone? (laughs) Jesus is coming suddenly. No man knows the hour. And the call is to be prepared. The call is to be looking. The call is in light of the fact that Jesus is coming, make sure you are prepared. Now, very quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time for the sake of time, but verses 41 through 48, what Jesus is really telling us is the servants that were ready and were prepared, they were blessed. The servants that took it for granted, they knew that he was coming, but they just went to sleep and said, well, he's not coming now. I mean, they were punished, and they were disciplined, and they were corrected. Who in the room remembers when I ask you, do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus, say amen. Amen. Uh, I've told this story once before a long time ago and uh, was reminded of it this weekend. I'm the youngest of four children. I know that you have a very difficult time believing that I'm the youngest. Someone has to be, yes or no. But I was the youngest of four children. I had a sister 15, a brother 13, a brother 11, then there was me. Don't you know I changed their world? My mom bought me a t-shirt when I was a kid. It said if I would have been twins, my parents would have left home. And I don't really know why, but for some strange reason, I had a habit of, uh, when I was a kid, breaking things. It wasn't that I just tried to break things, but I had a habit of breaking things. And this is the God's honest truth. I wish this were not true, but I broke over a period of time seven windows in our home. And I don't know why. It just always seemed to happen. And I'm not going to go through all of the different seven ways that I did it, <laughs> but uh, I did. Well, my dad, uh, his, his name was John, and... Uh, He was an incredibly brilliant man, and uh, the older I get, the more I realize how smart he really was, and he was way ahead of his time on things that he was able to figure out. Me and him always had difficulty when it came to math because to this day, I just don't like math. Uh, I'm thankful I don't have to take any more math classes. I'm done, and you'll never convince me why we should figure out that an X equals anything. I don't care. I just don't care. If you want to major in math, knock yourself out. Have yourself a good time, but I'm done. Can I get a witness from anyone? I'm done. I'm finished with it. And please, math teachers, don't don't say, well, I'll sit down and tutor you. I I don't want to. I don't want to be tutored. I don't want to know. I don't. My daughter's taking calculus. what, what, What is calculus? What is that? And I've asked 10 people and no one can tell me. And if you know, don't walk up to me after church. I don't want to hear. I don't want to know. I've made it 51 years not knowing what calculus is. I'll be okay. I'll make it through life. And you don't really know because it doesn't make a lick of sense. What I do know is my wife's good at all of that stuff, but she has to have me when she goes to a sale. Who knows what I mean? (laughs) What's 25% off of? And I can tell her, well, I can tell you how you can save 100%. Just follow me. (laughs) But my dad was a math genius. He loved math. And uh, I did not like math. And he could look at a problem and without even working it out, say this was the answer. And I just blew my mind. I couldn't understand it. And so one particular time my dad was working on something, and I, th- I think it had something to do, believe it or not, with solar power. And this was back in the 80s, a long, long time ago. And uh, so he ordered these two tanks. I guess they'd resemble a fish aquarium, but they, were, they, they had to be special ordered. And it took a long time for them to come in. They were very expensive, and he waited. You know, back in those days, you just couldn't order things online and get it the next day. And I say these things when I preach so that people that have no clue what I'm talking about understand what it was like to grow up back in those good old days. Yes or no? You didn't just order things and it get shipped to your front porch the next day, Julie. It didn't just show up. He... he, he <laughs> Yeah. Son, I need a police escort out of this place today. <laughs> but um, so anyway, he ordered it. It took a while to come in. And he was so happy the day he came home and had them in the back of his truck. 
And uh, he said, come help me unload it. And I helped him unload it. We put it in our carport. And then he looked at me. And the reason I told you about the seven windows is you'll understand. He said, stay away from these. <laughs> yes, sir. You can count on me. <clears throat> well, a couple hours later, uh, one of my older brothers uh, walked me outside and he put a croquet ball. I'm talking about one of those old-fashioned croquet balls in my hand. And he said, you know, we really need to test this uh, tank and see if it's durable enough. And so daddy would appreciate you testing it. And so what I need you to do is take this croquet ball and as hard as you can, roll it and let's see what happens. And I said, I don't believe all to do that. He said, chicken, chicken. <laughs> those are fighting words, yes or no. You don't go, call me a chicken, I'll show you, get out of the way. So as hard as I could, I rolled that croquet ball and that thing shattered into a thousand pieces and my brother took off, left me there for my, my dad walked out and, um, <laughs> oh. Let me tell you what he didn't do just real quick. He didn't say, you want a latte? You, you want to talk? Let's talk, son. How does that make you feel? Tell me some emotions you're feeling right now. I mean, he didn't do all of that. Go in your little quiet room, get a quiet space. Let's count one, two. He didn't do that. He wore my blessed assurance out, yes or no. Amen? I'll explain that one next week, but nevertheless... We cleaned it all up, and then he said, stay away from this other one. Well, of course I have enough sense to stay away from that one. You would think. <laughs> so my other brother comes out a couple hours later, and he says, Jerry, come here. And he puts some water in the aquarium, and he said, I want to see if you can fit your entire body in the aquarium. And I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, I double dog dare you. Did y'all grow up hearing that? Double dog dare, what do you mean, double dog dare? Well, you stand back, big boy. And I got in it, and it shattered. And my brother got in his car, drove away, and was just waving at me while he was leaving. And there I was. My daddy was a big man, and I could hear him walking through the house to me. Oh, my goodness. And uh, who knows, that would have been a good time for the rapture. Yes or no, that would have been, would have been a good time. And um, as I think back on that story, as silly and funny and tragically as true as it is, I want, you to, I want to tell you what comes to my mind. I loved my dad uh, more than I can tell you. But I did not love his appearing. <laughs> Amen? And there's a whole lot of folks who love Jesus but they don't love his appearing. Mm -mm. No. Yeah. And, and just every so often, you know, I don't know how often, but every so often we just kind of need, don't we, a wake-up call. Amen. Yes, no, I need it. What about you? I need the Lord to pull my chain. What about you? And we need to be brought to repentance, and we need to be brought to holiness, and we need to be brought to serious business, and we need to be brought to Man, doing what the Lord's called us to do because he's coming back, and I want to be ready. And when he opens that door, I want to be able to say, welcome back, Jesus. I've been looking for you. Amen? Amen. Who in this room believes Jesus is coming again? Amen. Listen to me, please. He's coming. And don't allow the foolishness of other people to lessen the truth in your heart that he's coming. And we've got a story to tell. And we've got people to warn. Quickly, and we'll pray. The Bible says it this way. Two are going to be in a field. One's going to be taken. One's going to be left. Two are going to be in a bed. One's going to be taken. The other's going to be left. Don't let that day come upon you like a thief in the night. And John said, and now little children abide in him so we can have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Jesus is coming. God help me to be ready.